her suffering from an abnormal smell in his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So, taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. And then to humiliate you, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, in the tradition in which I grew up uh, have always been men, it has created a division in the way that Mother's Day and Father's Day have been represented in the pulpit. See, Mother's Day was always an opportunity to bless the role of motherhood. And Father's Day provided a challenge for men to do better. Now, both ideas are true. Mothers and fathers both deserve honor. It's commanded in Scripture that we honor our father and mother. The first commandment given was promise. But to all the honest mothers and fathers, we know that we are in need of God's mercy. We need mercy from God, we need mercy from our spouse, and we need mercy from our children because we know we could do better. So the text today will highlight three areas where Christ followers, whether we are male or female, whether we are parents or single, Three areas where we can all do better. Now, please do not think that you are exempt from the message just because of your parent status. Just because you're not a father doesn't mean you're exempt from what God is going to tell us this morning. I believe today's text has something challenging to say to each of us Regarding our ethics, the way we treat other people. Regarding our pride, the way we view ourselves. And the way that we treat others. See, first we will see the priority of love in verses 1 through 6. This is our ethics. How do we relate to others who are around us? The story begins with an awkward situation because Jesus finds himself, according to verse 1, at a luncheon. Now, Jewish historian Josephus describes the expectation of what would happen. As Josephus writes, the sixth hour, which was now come, had dissolved the assembly. 
assembly. At which hour our laws require us to go to dinner on Sabbath day. They actually had a law that church had to be done by noon so that they could go to dinner? Well, now that you are aware of this Jewish law, I kind of have expect Chris Harris or Casey Harshman to laminate a sign and if the clock ever hits 12 o'clock, I may be reminded that rule number 279 from Josephus' law says it's time to dismiss and go to church. So just remember, if number 279, it's time to go to lunch. And that was the law in Jesus' day, or that was the cultural expectation, according to historian Josephus. Now, in, in verses uh, 14, one word appears ten times. A, um, a lifesaver to the first person to find out which word it is. <laughs> I am looking, we're not finding. What word appears ten times in verses 7 to 15? Invite. Invite. There we go. Sharon, you, you can help yourself to a candy bar on your way out of church this morning. <laughs> Now, you may be saying, now wait a sec, I only count nine invites. Preacher, how do you say that there are ten? Well, in verse 10, the word that is translated host in Luke's language was the inviter. So there were nine times where it says if you are invited, and then there in verse 10 is kind of that sneaky one, when the inviter says to you. Now, I see that in that verse we're talking about invitation, but in these first six verses, that word doesn't appear at all. And, and something that happens so frequently and not at all kind of creates a, a contrast in my mind. So I don't believe Jesus was necessarily welcomed or invited to this luncheon. He just found himself at the, at the luncheon because that's the way it was done. Because verse 1 says, when he went to the luncheon, they were watching him carefully. Have you found yourself in that situation where you didn't feel welcome, but you felt like you were being watched? <coughs> That's where Jesus is. I, I, I get the sense that Jesus is not a, a, a cordial guest, but somehow he feels, I'm being set up here. Because verse 2 describes a man, a man with very specific needs, who was present at the event. But notice what happens as soon as Jesus heals him. As Jesus heals him in verse 4, he is sent away. I guess he wasn't welcome at the lunch. He was there. He wasn't a guest. It's kind of a setup. Jesus, what are you going to do with this guy? And after Jesus heals him, the man is sent away. Now what the, the English Standard Version or the New American Standard calls dropsy, if you have a New International Version, it says he had abnormal swelling. Different words to translate that was well, actually in edema or a swelling of the lymph nodes. And this swelling could be very painful and could be a symptom of heart or kidney failure. Now, the first time that I heard this read in the uh, video that we just saw, I heard it as there was a man who, su who suffered from extreme sweating. It's 
not extreme sweating, it's extreme swelling as the body would retain the fluids. Now, as I consider this man and his condition, he's there at the luncheon kind of as a setup, and those who are at the luncheon wonder, what will Jesus do? Here's a man in pain, but it is Sabbath. Well, back in chapter 13, verse 10, Jesus had already healed in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So likely, this is just one of those, well, let's see with our own eyes what Jesus does if we set him up. Will Jesus do on the Sabbath after the synagogue? Because they just wanted to make sure this wasn't a one-time thing, that Jesus healed the woman who was doubled up. But in verse 3, we have to see that this was a question of legality. Because this was Sabbath, because this was the leader of the, of the Pharisees, that there were rules and there were protocols that were expected to happen. Just because Jesus may have found himself in a situation that the others did not anticipate, it doesn't mean that the protocols disappear. Eating on the Sabbath would have required preparation on Friday. And as a ruler of the Pharisees, this host was in the upper ranks of society with all of the expectations that would go along with that. But notice, Jesus does not permit the religious rules or the protocols of society to get in the way of his ethics. He does the right thing. See, now these leaders in, in Luke chapter 14 apparently learned from the leaders in Luke chapter 13. Because in Luke chapter 13, they called out Jesus. How dare you do that? And Jesus shamed them for their hypocrisy. So Jesus asked those at his luncheon, when he sees the man with needs, so any of you have anything to say? They all began looking around the room. They didn't say anything. And in the last chapter, Jesus pointed out that human beings deserve better than our livestock. And if you will allow your cow or your oxen to approach the well, if you'll untie them from the barn and let them approach the well so that they can get a drink of water, how much more should we do what is kind for a fellow human? See, in chapter 13, he spoke of livestock approaching the well. But here he talks about if one of you has a son who falls into the well, it's a situation that any father would immediately leap into action. If your son or daughter fell into a well, we went to wonder, hmm, you know, this is a religious day. Maybe we ought to just leave them there. There's not a father alive who would respond that way. And Jesus said as such, if any of you has a son who falls into a well, you're going to immediately help him. And here's a man who needed help on the Sabbath, away from the synagogue. <laughs> and so Jesus heals him. Now, I, I think that there's in some ways a, a, a limitation that is happening in the situation. See, they, they wanted to limit how and when Jesus would do certain things. Well, if Jesus did not allow being in a synagogue on Sabbath to keep him from showing compassion to a crippled woman, he sure wasn't going to allow a Sabbath luncheon to keep him from being kind to a man with potential heart failure. My friend, the challenge for us is we're not about 
any situation or protocol to keep you from doing the right thing. Because we see in 1 John chapter 4, if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And so we can't allow rules and protocols and expectations and societal norms to keep us from doing the right thing. So then Jesus moves from this real predicament with the real man to what the scripture says is a theoretic parable. He tells a story about the place of honor. He says, Jesus looks at the table and he saw how everyone was sitting and he notices that people chose the best seats in the house. By the way, the first three rows in the center, if this was a football game, all of you would clamor for this seat. However, I've noticed in this church, there's a lot of those back rows that fill up awful. <laughs> See, some places are more honorable for others. Some sit because that's where they hear best. Some sit because I don't want anyone looking at the back of my head. Some sit where we don't have distractions. And, and so we choose where we want to sit in a place like this. However, it wasn't quite the same in Jesus' day. Because some choose to sit in certain places of honor and others choose to sit elsewhere. Now, I told you a moment ago that the word invite appears nine or, or ten times in this section of the chapter. But what I didn't say earlier is that the language that Luke used to write this chapter has no less than 30 different words to talk about the idea of inviting. Anywhere from I'll inform you of the opportunity to the judge requests your attendance in the courtroom. And between these two extremes, there were 30 different words that Luke could have used to talk about what it means to invite people to the banquet. And the one that he uses is right in the middle of those 30 words. It has the idea of a polite invitation by the way, it would be nice if you could be here. And it also has tones or a sense of it's to your own good for you to choose to be here. Somewhere between I invite you, I call you, I urge you, I persuade you, I insist or I command that you be here. And right here in the middle, Jesus is saying, when you consider the invitation to come to Christ at the banquet, it's right in the middle of my saying, it's in your best interest to say yes to this invitation. See, some invitations are very low expectation. Kind of like the, you know, we ought to get together for coffee sometime. And we use this one. Yeah, that would be a good idea, and it never happens. But other invitations are more like the date to your senior prom. When you receive that invitation, you know it's a memorable event and it requires a response. Well, picking up on the narrow door and the shut door that we saw in chapter 13, Jesus has said that there will be a time when the door is shut and those who are on the outside will be weeping and gnashing their teeth while those who are on the inside, to piggyback on a wonderful children's story, the inside and the outside, on which side are you? Those who are on the inside get to recline and to rest at Jesus' table. I believe that Jesus wants to think about this feast as more important just a week, than just a weekly dinner. See, wedding feasts in Jesus' day can last up to a week, six, seven days of celebration. And those who were on the outside felt let down. We look in verse 
verse 14, and we see Jesus mentions this resurrection of the just. I believe Jesus has in mind how important it is for people to choose to align now with his eternal kingdom and to prepare for the marriage supper of the Lamb. This isn't an invitation to, let's get together and share a Pope sometime. This is an invitation that says, it's time for you to choose. Are you going to be a part of the kingdom or are you not? I invite you, I urge you, I encourage, I implore, I challenge you to say yes to the kingdom. For where we see ourselves in terms of his kingdom now, in inviting others to join the final banquet, is more important than what you may choose to grill or where you may choose to eat the following day. This is an invitation that is more than just a nicety. This is an important invitation. I invite you today. See, Jesus observed the seating at this luncheon, and he chose to point to a bigger reality in his parable. The reality is, is that seating does matter. I was visiting someone this week who has a very similar to experience to my family as it comes to dead chair. Any of you who have ever watched All in the Family featuring the old Archie Bunker will recall that Archie was quite protective of his chair. And this person from our community that I was speaking with this week spoke of how her adult son was visiting her, but when her husband returned, her son automatically got out of dad's chair without a word being said. Because it was understood when dad's here, that's dad's chair. I, I still recall the pecking order of seating in our family home. For, for, for Saturday evening hee-haw, or Sunday evening wonderful world of Disney, there were certain seats in our living room, and there was a pecking board. Dad's chair, an awful, ugly green recliner, was immediately in front of the television. Seat number two was on the left end of the sofa because it had an arm and you could recline against that arm to watch the television. Seat number three was the right third of the sofa because it also had an arm, but the angle of seeing the television was a little bit more awkward. Now, seat number four was mom's chair. It had two arms, but it was a little bit further away from the television. And it was mom's chair, but mom was usually so busy working around the house or in the kitchen or in the laundry that she very rarely sat in mom's chair. Seat number five, that was the middle of the sofa. But to sit in seat number five, you had to force your siblings to get the feet off of the sofa so that you could sit in middle cushion number three. Now, seat number six, that was the piano bench, or either the floor in front of the television. Now, we all knew that Dad's chair was likely to be used, so we didn't even try to sit there. Um, because if we sit there, and then Dad comes, all of a sudden, the main floor and the piano bench are on the floor because all the other seats are taken. Mom's chair, though, was more of a predicament because choosing seat number four would mean avoiding the argument with your siblings on taking their feet off the sofa to sit in seat number five. But it can also mean that if mom does come to sit in mom's chair, you find yourself on the piano bench. So choosing the piano bench to begin with meant that you were likely to get bumped up to one of the seats with an arm if the couch became available. Because seating matters. And I'm guessing your family had a similar pecking order 
this is where everybody would fit. See, the lesson of the parable of who sits where is important. In verse 11, again, we specifically see for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. If we sit in Dad's chair, we may end up on piano bench. And he who humbles himself from Proverbs chapter 16 puts it this way pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall and it's just as true now as when it was written over 4,000 years ago and it remains true after the resurrection where we read in some of the latest New Testament writings, humble yourselves therefore before God, and he will exalt you. Or 1 Peter chapter 5, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you. Everybody needs to humble himself and give deference to others. You know, I enjoy the parades that we have here in Chase County. Whether it's the senior promenade that happens around graduation or the homecoming parade and the pep rally at the courthouse. Maybe it's the, the rodeo parade that happened two weeks ago. But while the parades that we have here in Chase County are usually over and done within about an hour, I live some other places where police have literally been called to intervene into seating issues at the parade. The 4th of July parade in Kenosha, Wisconsin is one example. The 4th of July parade is a big deal. More than 24 hours in advance, people will mark out their territory on the parade route. Blankets are laid out to mark the turf with stakes to hold the blankets against the wind. Kind of understood if there's a blanket there, then that means that someone's called dibs on that stakes. Lawn chairs are set out in traffic cones to indicate I call dibs on this certain section of the route. The people will actually use ropes and they will tie one mailbox to a sign or, or to a post and hang a sign that says, this spot is taken. And families are known for a tradition. Year after year after year, you'll find the Johnson family seated on this side of the street in this section of the block on the route. Everybody knows that's the Johnson side. And in Kenosha, it's more the, the Ruffalos and Italian sounding names, so you know their family will be on that side. Because parade seating is a huge deal. And don't even think about setting your lawn chair in front of a group who has already staked their claim. Because seating is and that's the problem that, that Jesus was talking about. At banquets, to try and get somebody to leave their seat so that you can sit there is about like children trying to get a, a sibling to move when they're in the seat that they want. But what starts here as a predicament leads to a parable that Jesus says, humble yourself. And allow God to raise you up in the appropriate time. But Jesus takes this parable, and then he pronounces a principle. And the principle is that the marginalized deserve promise. In these last uh, three verses, Jesus is saying, we've got to give prominence to those who are marginalized. Because we have to ask ourselves, who is at the banquet? Because even more important 
then, then where people sit is the question is who is at the banquet? Verses 7 through 11 describe when you find yourself as a guest, but these last three verses speak of when you are the host, when you are given the opportunity to invite others, who do you invite? See, over the last 18 months, we here in Chase County and all over our country, as a matter of fact, have found out how difficult it can be to distribute tickets when the seating is limited. When you're only allowed to invite 10 people to your graduation, who do you invite? And limited seating has caused significant angst in our community. But the banquet we have in front of us, it's not just that there are limited seats available and make sure that you get your seats. The banquet Jesus is talking about has unlimited seats. And so he says to invite everybody. Verse 12 speaks of who gets prioritized when social standing is considered important. When social standing is important, we only invite the people that will be able to repay us. But in verse 13, we can be generous when seating is not limited. When seating is not limited, we get to invite all the people when it is in their best interest to be at the event. I love how Isaiah 55, 1 invites all to come to Christ's banquet. As Isaiah says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk. Without money, without price. What a beautiful invitation that all can come. Come to the banquet. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, it reminds us that we have received grace freely, and so we should freely give grace to others as well. You know, and as we talk about freely giving grace, I consider the idea of spending somebody else's money. Have you ever been put in a place where you got to spend somebody else's money? Well, because of my role as a minister to the community, I found myself in different situations. I found myself in situations where I was entrusted to administer a fund. I was in one community where the ministerial alliance had a shared fund that every pastor in town could use to help motorists or those with a pressing financial need. And I participated freely in that group. Um, but it, like our food pantry here, had firm regulations about who got what and how much they got. Because if one person gave too much, the next time that person came, they'd say, well, so-and-so gave me more. Why won't you give me more? So we all had to follow the rules, and so we all administered the fund in a fair basis. There's a second situation I found myself where I was in charge of a fund, and I had to give an account for the way that I would use it. I've been in churches that gave me a flat amount for the year, and they would entrust me to give as much or as little to each individual as long as the money lasted throughout the year. Now, knowing that the money had to last for the whole year, I tended to be a lot more generous in November, December than I was in January, February, because I wanted to make sure that the funds lasted. So how generous are we when we spend somebody else's money? Do we follow the rules? Are we more generous sometimes than others? Now, I've also been in situations that and I don't mean this to toot my own horn because I know you've been there too. I've been in situations where I reached into my own pocket because getting re reimbursement could have meant more questions and more hassle, so I just covered it myself. But the most freeing situation of spending somebody else's money is when someone says, here's a Jackson or here's a Grant, give it to somebody in need. In that situation, I have freely received, and I am free to give it away without any accountability, without any limit, etc. I received it.
this, and so now I give it to you freely. And that's the situation Jesus is speaking to us. If we have freely received his salvation, freely give it away to others. We should not be stingy in our sharing of the good news. That's this last situation is what Jesus described in verse 14. God gives us tickets to his banquet that have already been paid for by Jesus' death on Calvary. And it is our privilege to go out into the highways and the gravel roads and invite people to come to Christ. Matthew chapter 22 says, Then we go to the roads where the city and invite, compel, Well, the application of today's sermon is pretty simple to describe, but very hard to live out. It is this. Number one, we need to prioritize love. Prioritize love by never allowing protocols to keep you from doing the right and the loving thing for another person. When we prioritize love, we find ourselves honoring others. We humble ourselves by seeing others in the place of honor, and we trust God to elevate us in his time. And finally, this is kind of a two-pronged application. Freely invite to the free banquet. The first part of that is each of you and myself needs to accept that free invitation to sit at God's banquet. By admitting our sin, believing that Jesus paid the full penalty with his death, and confess him as our Lord. And when you have made that choice to accept your seat at the table, then the second part is we get to freely invite the marginalized by urging them, persuading them, calling them to accept the free gospel 